First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Hello. Hello. Is that Appleton three six three? It is Harding speaking. Oh, um, are you? I mean, I'd like to speak to the secretary of the arts club. Yes, speaking. Oh, hello. My name is Francis Drew. I just moved to the area. My classmate and I, and we'd be interested in joining the arts club, but we'd like some more information, really. You know about joining and the sorts of activities you do. Yes. Well, what do you want? Our calendar. Ask at the library. I'll make sure that there are plenty there by Thursday. That's all right for you. Yes, fine, thank you. But、um, would you mind telling me how much it costs to join? Membership fee for an adult is two pounds fifty per year, of course. What exactly does club membership entitle one to? Entitle you to? Oh,、uh, for a start, there's the、uh, club events. You get invited to them, of course. They're for members and only、um, they are free. What sorts of events are there? I mean. You'll see what they are when you get hold of a calendar. But well, there's club evening, for instance, once a month, usually Wednesdays from eight till ten. And whereabouts do you hold them? Club evenings,、uh, the the beach pavilion. Do you know it? No, I don't think I do. It's not near the seafront, is it? No, up past the tennis courts on Park Avenue. You know where that is. No, I'm afraid I don't. We'd soon find it, though. Quite good. I don't know what your interests are. Music? Got any musical talents? I'm not sure about talents exactly. I like music. We both do. Do either of you sing? Oh yes, we've both been in choirs. Well, there you are then. The club's got a very fine choir, very fine. I'm in it myself, as a matter of fact. We have practices every Friday evening, and it's no good just thinking of joining if you can't make the practices. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. What's the procedure? I mean, if we decide to join the choir or any of the other activities, how do we go about it? You can't get into the choir without an audition. As far as the other sections are concerned, members have to apply through the section secretary in the first place. Yes, right. And the fee again? I've written it down somewhere. Two pound fifty each. And where do we send it to you? No, I'm the secretary. It's the treasurer who deals with that. I'll give you his name if you want to write it down. Yes, please. His name is Hosegood. H O S E, and then Good. Yes. Initial P. Address Three Clay Hill, Appleton. Right, and it's all right to send a check. That's the usual. Yes, payable to Appleton Arts Club, Appleton A. Double P L E T O N. Oh, and、uh, better put your address on the back as you're new.、Uh, and incidentally, there's a newsletter out three times a year, just to keep club members up to date with what's going on. They they're sent to everyone. That's good. Um, just one last thing. Would you mind telling me what the other sections are, so that I can tell my classmate and we. The players. That's our act group. I've told you. Choir, you know about. There's the gramophone circle, the music workshop, the literary and discussion group. Oh, that one meets in different members' homes. Then there's the studio workshop, and、um, what have I missed out? Oh yes, the art talks. That's the lot, I think. Ah, the film society. That's the other one. Got them all. Ah、oh, yes, just about. Thank you very much. You've been very helpful. Not at all. Pleased to assist, and、uh, look forward to meeting you and your classmates at the club. Yes, thank you. Goodbye then. You have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to sixteen. First of all, a warm welcome to Barker's Country Safaris. We're delighted to have you all on board for this season. I know you've all been told a bit about the company when you had your job interview, but I thought it would be worth telling you a bit more about ourselves. 
Barker's was set up 10 years ago by myself, John, and my then girlfriend and now wife, Nancy. We started it initially just as a hobby. We felt that there was a good opportunity to share our love of the countryside in this part of the world with the many visitors who come here. As you know, most people come for the beaches in the summer, but there is so much more to the region, and this is what we wanted to exploit. Nancy and I were born near here, and as teenagers, we went climbing, kayaking, white water rafting, potholing, and just straightforward walking. This district is in our blood, and we love it. <laughs> While we were still at university, we started taking small groups of visitors out into the National Park in Nancy's brother's old Land Rover. We'd drive them around the back lanes and into the forest. We'd also organise rock climbing tours for friends of friends. Then, each year, without us having to advertise, people came back to us to ask for more excursions and trips. So, five years ago, we gave up our other jobs to focus full-time on Barker's Country Safaris. Now, two years after that, we set up the activity tour part of the business, and one year ago, we expanded into organising activities for school groups during term time. Obviously, this was a massive challenge with all the health and safety requirements, but it's proving a great success. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 17 to 20. Anyway, we'll certainly not be dealing with school parties during the summer holidays. Our clients for the next three months are mostly family parties or groups of friends, and I'd like to talk a bit now about the tours we offer and what your responsibilities will be. Our most popular excursion is the Woodland Tour and Trail. Now, often this is sold out and we have all of our 10 Jeeps and convoy with eight people in each Jeep. It's a lot of fun. These tours really offer a taster of what we can provide. So as both driver and guide, it is important that you do a good job here so they come back for the bigger tours. Uh, I will talk about the commission package later. As the summer days are so long, we have three tours each day, but you will not be expected to work on more than two of them. Morning tours start at 8am and go to midday. Afternoon tours are from 2pm to 6pm, and then evening ones, 7pm to 11pm. All the tours follow the same route, and you should have made yourselves familiar with all the key information. This was provided to you in the information pack you were sent when you accepted the job offer. This is important, so if you haven't had time yet, please do so now. Our second most popular tour is the Family Exclusive. Now, this tour is for the whole day and for only one group. Usually it is just one Jeep, but sometimes there are two if the party is large. These tours go from 10 a.m. till 5 p.m. and include lunch at the Brown Bear in Lower Middleton. We have a number of different routes for these tours as we don't want our premium clients being made to feel that they are part of a large package deal. Uh, you will be told which route to take with your weekly schedule. Now, I'd like to move on to these specialty tour packages. These are the ones that we are keen to book people on once they've done the woodland tour and trail trip. Now listen carefully to the first part of the discussion and answer questions 21 to 24. Thanks for coming to this meeting on such short notice, Anna and Veronica. It looks like we have just become the organising committee for this year's International Film Festival. 
We've all just met, so perhaps we should start by an introduction with a bit of background from each of us. Okay, I'm Anna. I finished three years of a languages degree in Sweden, where I come from. This year, I decided to study overseas to get to know a different part of the world. I'm also a big fan of European cinema, especially French and Italian. Those are the languages I majored in, along with English. To me, film is a great way to learn about the rest of the world. I was in the film club at my university, so when I saw the notice asking for volunteers, I thought it would be a good way to meet people and get involved in something I really enjoy. Thanks, Anna. My name is Veronica, and I come from Italy. I'm doing graduate studies in English literature. I went to some of the films in the festival last year and enjoyed them. I especially like the video interviews. That was when I decided to get involved. I used to do film reviews for our student newspaper back home. Hi, I'm Chris from Scotland, and I'm in fourth year journalism. Cinema is my hobby. Last year, I joined the organising committee, just like you have now, and somehow this year, I've ended up in charge. I'm actually able to use my coordinating work on the festival towards a credit for one of my courses. I have to write up a report on the festival with recommendations, so that's an extra motivation for me. So I hope this is going to be a good experience for us all. Okay, where would you like to start? How about a general overview of the festival? I don't really know much about it. Well, the film festival was started by International Student Society five years ago and has grown every year. It is held over four nights during study break. Wednesday to Saturday. Normally, we show three films a night. Last year, we tried to choose films from different parts of the world that fit together in some way, maybe a similar theme, or we could feature a type of film like action films or science fiction. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Who picks the films? It's up to us on the committee to decide. You mean we get to pick all the films ourselves? What a hard decision! There are so many to choose from. Well, that's the fun part. We have this catalogue of independent distributors. The films are listed by language and have a short summary. We just have to go through it to find a good combination of films that will attract an audience. Veronica mentioned something about interviews. How does that fit in? We set up cameras in the foyer of the theatre and did live interviews before, during intermission, and after the screening. Anyone from the audience could come up and talk about the film. The Broadcasting and Journalism School set it up and ran the interviews. They were shown on big screens around the lobby and in the theatre. It went over really well. We had a long lineup of students waiting to be interviewed on TV. Everybody wanted their minute of fame. Great idea. Yeah, it worked really well. We should certainly do something similar again. Maybe even develop the idea further, like a website with audience reviews and discussion, so we can get as much participation and involvement as possible. Hey, that's a good idea. Can I ask a question? None of the films are in English, right? Are they dubbed or subtitled? Well. We do occasionally choose a film in English, but only from unusual places where the dialect is so strong they sometimes need subtitles, like the Caribbean or even Scotland. The majority of films in the festival are foreign language dubbed in English. We've learned from experience that students don't like reading subtitles. Maybe they read too much already. Whatever the reason, the subtitled films get smaller audiences. So we avoid them as much as possible. So, how large an audience can we expect, and how much does it cost to get in? It costs five dollars per film, or a twenty-dollar pass for the whole event. All twelve films for the real movie fan. We would have broken even last year, except for a bad storm on the Friday night. We almost had to cancel the whole thing, but overall, we had a good turnout. More than two thousand people in four days. Oh, that's what I was wondering about—the financial part. Where does the funding come from? What kind of budget do we have? 
The festival is subsidised by the Student Council. We generate money through advertising and through admission charges. We'll go over the budget in details a little later, but we've got lots of work to do in the meantime. I guess we have to start pretty soon. Well, I think by the 1st of March at the latest. We need to select all the films. Then we have to find some advertisers to sponsor the event. That shouldn't be too hard. We'll just start with last year's list. Our deadline for that should be the middle of March. By the end of March, we need to design the programme. Then we can get posters made up and distributed in April. Like you said, we need some clever promotion. Something to generate interest and get people talking. We have four months to get ready. It should be enough time. OK, where do we start? Let's start by talking about films, since that is the best part, and see what we come up with. What was the best film you saw last year? Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello everyone. I'm glad so many people have shown up here today to hear about these fascinating little creatures called the Turbellaria. My name is Dr. Baker, and I've spent 20 years researching thousands of different species of platyhelminths, what are commonly known as flatworms, both free-living and parasitic. So there are a lot of things I could tell you about these extremely interesting invertebrate, but I will try to keep it short. Turbellaria are unique amongst flatworms in three ways. The first one is that, unlike 80% of all platyhelminths, turbellaria do not need to secure nourishment from a living source. This means that they do not generally parasitize a host, but are instead found living freely in the environment. So, no need to worry about any of these little samples I've got here escaping and causing havoc. The second way in which they're different is that they are, well, they're incredibly simple. And by simple, I don't mean in terms of structure, as their structure is indeed quite complex, and I'll get to that later. By simple, I mean that they're not the brightest bulbs in the box. Flatworms in general are not known for their cognitive abilities, especially when compared with other invertebrates such as cuttlefish or octopuses or even insects. But amongst flatworms, turbellaria are by far the most primitive of the bunch. Finally, and this is a direct result of the first thing I mentioned, turbellaria tend to have a much more complicated sensory system in their head region. This includes a set of eyes with receptors that can detect light, as well as chemical sensory organs that assist turbellaria in locating food. Obviously, as other flatworms receive nutrition directly from their host, they have no need for this. Despite these three differences, however, turbellaria are quite similar to other flatworms in all sorts of other ways. First of all, as their name suggests, they're incredibly flat, which allows them to hide under stones. They're symmetrical on both sides, and they don't have a body cavity. They also don't have any specialized respiratory, skeletal, and circulatory systems. What they do have, however, and this is what I meant when I referenced their structure before, is three layers known as the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm, as well as a head region where their brain and sense organs are located, and a spongy connective tissue that fills all the space between their organs. Finally, like most species of flatworms, they're hermaphrodites. This means that a single flatworm has a set of each gender. But don't take this to mean they reproduce alone. Their preferred method of reproduction is called cross-fertilization, which means that each flatworm fertilizes the other. I mentioned before that most flatworms need a host, but turbellaria feed from the environment. So what do they feed on? Most turbellaria can be found either in fresh or salt water, and they feed on small insects, microscopic matter, and crustaceans. They will pretty much eat anything they find. They have no preference on whether their food is living or dead. Also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits. Also, and this is the most remarkable part about their eating habits, if they ever find themselves in a situation where food is scarce, they might also feed on themselves. That's right, they'll start eating their own body, starting with the least essential muscles and organs and working their way up. 
They will shrink in size until they're able to find food again, at which point they'll begin to regenerate everything they've lost. One final thing about food, and apologies in advance if I disgust you, Turbillaria don't possess an anus, which means that their mouth, which is a muscular opening on the underside of their body, has to serve as one. Before I finish this presentation, one more thing you've probably heard before, but weren't sure if it was a myth or not. I mentioned already that Turbillaria can reproduce on their own, but there's a second method they can use, which is known as fission. Now, as a child, you were probably told that if you cut a worm in half, it will grow into two new worms. That's not entirely true, but flatworms are not worms exactly, and they do have the ability to regenerate by splitting into two, perhaps even more smaller parts, at which point each part regrows the missing organs and becomes a brand new turbillarian. Now, this is extremely important for us, and this is how I'd like to close this presentation because their ability to regenerate endlessly makes them virtually immortal, and it might open pathways to regeneration in human cells or slowing the human aging process, which is why scientists like myself have been studying these unique creatures, hoping to get some answers. Thank you for listening, and please come along to see me and my samples if you have any further questions. You now have half a minute to check your answers.